Morning all, let's have a look at a very interesting game that occurred yesterday. Magnus Carlsen was playing white against Judith Polgar. So they they had been battling out in the Rapid uh, Festival in Mexico City and uh, there was one Rapid game and one blindfold game if you remember. In the first uh, Rapid game uh, Judith managed to win and in the blindfold Magnus got revenge and in the playoff Magnus won. So that was uh, more than a week ago they played each other. Uh, but now, in this longer classical time control, what would happen? Bang was playing white, played c4. And with c4, he's probably wanting to steer the game into positional waters with minimal counterplay for Judith, who up to this point hasn't been having a great tournament. She hasn't been given much counterplay by, by anyone, really. Um, especially uh, with black pieces, it's been a very difficult time. Uh, but I think that's one of the jobs of the top players, not to uh, let their opponents excel and play in positions they, they like and enjoy. So here we see, OK, Judith elects for c5, which seems sensible enough. Now knight f3 has the idea that potentially white can play for an early break in the center with d4. And in fact, this is exactly what happens now. Knight c6 doesn't really put off white from playing d4. And I guess you can consider it's kind of a Sicilian defense. It could have come out of the Sicilian defense now, the exchange of the d-pawn for the c-pawn. So what are the differences here after knight takes d4? Is Magnus playing like a, a Maroxy bind variation against the Sicilian? After knight f6, knight c3, an obvious difference is that there's no pawn on e4 just yet. Okay, and does there need to be? Black now plays e6, and there might be a dangerous threat of crippling the pawns here with bishop b4 and bishop takes c3. And that's prevented with a3, preventing that pin and any disruption which could occur. White wants to keep control of d4 quite cleanly without interruption as well. Bishop c5, and the knight goes back for the moment, and the bishop now drops back. So was that a bit of a waste of time from black, or is the idea really just to let this knight be on a passive square? Well, I think white still has a, a nagging edge here and setting up the Maroxy bind now, and it really does look like it could have come from the Sicilian defence, this position. After castles, what is Black's active plan for gen generating some counterplay here? Judith elects for the move B B6 here after Bishop E2 B6. Okay, the advantage is well, the Bishop can come quite quickly to B7. A Knight E5 later, maybe provoking White to push some pawns. Pressure on E4 later, try and break out with d5 maybe after moving the queen maybe the queen can go behind the bishop that's a hyper modern plan and actually that's one of the plans that we're, we're going to see in this game so that's the plan but we'll check in the second pass if there was anything more um, perhaps more dangerous than that plan okay but uh, okay let's go with it so bishop b7 bishop b bishop f4 as though bishop d6 is very interesting for white. It will be a nasty blockade against black's uh, pawn structure. d6 prevents it. Rook c1 now. Seems sensible enough. And actually, it almost like discourages a move like queen c7 because there might be something like knight d5 confronting the queen tactically. So maybe that's why Judith's quite careful not immediately to play a queen move like that. But there's also, of course, on queen c7, knight b5 as well, just targeting d6. So actually, that seems completely unplayable here to play queen c7. So rook c8, and now we see rook e1. Knight e5 shielding d6, which means actually it is now becoming possible to play queen c7 with, with d6 shielded from this bishop. Also, of course, there's a threat on c4 here. 
So it seems a logical enough move. And black doesn't really mind bishop takes e5. I think that will increase black's control over central squares, having these double pawns. And the bishops look quite good here. I think Magnus wants to avoid that. Because d4 is kind of a weakness in white structure here with the Roxy bind in any case. So he just plays knight d2, improving this, this knight a little bit. It didn't have too many prospects on b3, but you might think d4, but uh, it was needed to protect c4, knight fd7. Okay. And we see now the possibility, maybe, of black interested in bishop g5 to exchange off the dark square bishops, which would weaken, for example, d4 later. Bishop g5 might be in black, black's interest. But with this next move, a crafty re little retreat, f4 is now on the cards. And so bishop g5 can be answered with f4, but also f4 will be good anyway for gaining space. So white is preparing to gain more space here, basically. And queen c7, we see b4 gaining space on the queen side, preventing black's use of c5. So these pieces are becoming a bit cramped. And the most aggressive piece can be dislodged with f4. So I'm not sure this is such a rosy picture for black at this moment. However, at least knight b5 can be answered by queen b8 without losing material. If the queen can go to b8, it can go to a8 and put more pressure on e4. And in fact, the queen voluntarily goes to b8 here. And we see f4 gaining more space. OK. Knight g6, which might imply d5 later, because the knight is usefully uh, putting pressure on f4. But uh, g3, holding down the position more on both sides. All of these pawns are kind of protected, double protected in some cases. This pawn's protected by knight and bishop. Uh, this pawn by the bishop here and this pawn here. So there's not really much to attack. These knights are being kept out of key squares like e5, c5. So where is black's counterplay? Is it along this diagonal? That's a big question. Rook f, e8, as though there's some tactical vulnerability made with d5 later. But uh, bishop f3 it looks pretty safe, and that strengthens this kind of Roxy bind without losing any pawn because the knight's protecting c4. Queen a8. Now bishop f2 adding more support for e4. Okay, bit of a bind to get out of from black's point of view. How does black liberate to get some counterplay here? Judith plays knight g f8, and then we see queen e2. What's the idea? Is it e5? Queen b8, as though the idea might be e5, which might not be pleasant for black, because e5 might strike at the dark squares and use the e4 square which, with a menace for eyeing either d6, maybe even g5 later, or f6, if black weakens herself with g6. Now, after rook ed1, Judith was concerned by something here. Presumably, one one of the positional ideas, uh, something like e5. Another idea might be f5 even, but at the moment, knight e5 is too juicy by far. So actually, this next move, it looks to be quite weakening for the dark squares. And what does black actually get? In return, okay. Well, one idea might be potentially to part the bishop on g7. Another idea is to discourage f5s later, even if e5 is played first. Maybe it is kind of an attempt at prophylaxis here, but um, it does suffer some dark square weaknesses. Can Magnus exploit these dark square weaknesses? These three in particular. Well, his next move strikes at two of them straight away. Tactically, it's holding up. This pawn is holding up because if bishop takes, knight takes, recharges support for e5. So Judith actually didn't take on f3. She plays bishop c6, inviting white to take on c6. Also, e takes d6 looks a bit fragile, but um, bishop d6 black should be okay. Bishop d4. Looks a little bit more dangerous now, though, for e takes for this diagonal. 
rook e d8 and now bishop takes c6 is played rook takes c6 and now an overprotection as Nimzovich would call it of the e5 point which is one of his favourite points to overprotect black is not having a great time in this position it seems with dark square weaknesses and white overprotecting e5 here quite comfortably it seems the only issue might be this c pawn at the moment concrete issue Juliet takes on e5 and we see f takes e5 not a piece so why take with the f pawn I think one idea is this f file can be very dangerous for f7 in particular f7 is a natural target now on that f file but what about the c pawn rook d c8 and we see knight e4 protecting the c pawn just even more with the rook now okay queen c7 attacking the c pawn even more and now okay we see the move knight f d2 okay what is going on now why has magnus done this retreat here and what about the e5 pawn is that actually able to be taken here or is it far too dangerous we'll check that out in the second pass of this game for the moment Judith plays actually a6 and maybe actually that's that's actually the clue to be quite honest here because a6 looks to be to do with b5 so actually on knight takes e5 maybe b5 just simply wins the exchange in the clear blue sky from a clear blue sky so how is that actually possible well what's happened is a bit of congestion after uh, blacks we saw queen c7 there's congestion here cost to this setup that b5 if it wasn't losing c4 would be embarrassing that rook so by men's protecting the pawn he can afford to do this because of now b5 is actually a real threat in the position it seems so a6 instead of taking on e5 to stop b5 okay but the surprising thing now the turn of events now we're about to witness knight f2 looks sensible enough to protect e5 again so c4 and e5 at this moment are both protected but a tactical resource is available for black which would seem to make both pawns uh, into targets straight off the bat but it comes at some cost bishop g5 threatening to remove the defender of c4 <clears throat> and also potentially the queen away from e5 pardon me <clears throat> so this looks to be a dangerous move so what has Magnus got up his sleeve in this position if you had this position what would you play here it's a very very interesting concept to try and get a strategic backfire on on the dark squares here around that camp that's the clue can you guess the very very calm move which uh, Magnus plays in this position if I give you 10 seconds starting from now okay Magnus just plays rook f1 he's welcoming the removal of this dark square bishop he knows logically it should weaken some dark squares but that logic of weakening dark squares how does that translate into concrete tactics bishop takes d2 is used here as a resource but it's a bit controversial queen takes d2 okay a choice of pawns both look a little bit risky intuitively with these dark squares around the place Junit tries knight takes e5 and now we see a very very good move Judith is actually threatening the embarrassing knight f3 check for king queen and king something has to be done about that as well as maybe c4 you might think well move like knight e4 might be tempting but I think Magnus finds the absolute best move I suspect anyway you might think 
with the dark squares weak, the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do, is give up your dark square bishop, because surely the exploitation of these dark squares will be with this dark square bishop. Actually, that's not always the case. It doesn't have to be here. The very forcing move, bishop takes e5, voluntarily giving up the dark square bishop is played, because now with the queen on e5, it's a great tempo gainer for a very aggressive knight move. Knight g4. And it becomes clearer now what the point of this is. That really this this is looking very dangerous for both knight f6 and knight h6. Knight h6 check for f7. Very very dangerous indeed. Looks actually much more dangerous than f6. But we'll check these things out in the second pass. I believe this is the principal threat. If queen h5, knight f6 will win the queen. <laughs> so Judith plays a singly resourceful move, but is she skating on thin ice here with this next move, rook d6? She'll welcome the exchange of queens and lose even f7. And maybe white isn't totally winning there. But um, Magnus doesn't want to take on e5 then f7. He plays actually knight h6 check after king g7. Okay, what else? If king h8, knight takes f7, forking queen and king. So king g7, rook takes f7, king h8. Preserves the queens on the board for a moment longer with queen f2. Threatening rook takes f8, crashing through. Brutal. Judith has to defend this position with now queen d4. Seems one of the only moves. Let's create that pin against the queen. So rook takes f8 is not no longer threatened. You can just take because of this pin. Okay, does Magnus still have a dangerous position here? Dangerous position, so c5 is played. After b takes c, Magnus voluntarily takes the queen now on d4. c takes is of course ruled out, so rook takes. And now rook takes c5. He's emerged here with a very pleasant position indeed. And it looks far too dangerous to even take on c5 because of rook takes f8. But then uh, you might think king g7, so that's something we should check out as well. Okay, in second pass. For the moment, black plays rook cd8, and this gives a beautiful two rook on the seventh scenario, two rooks on that seventh. An immediate tactical threat, for example, rook g7, rook g8 to, to mate. This is a very dangerous threat indeed. Judith plays check, the king g2, another check with this rook, king h3. And now rook d5 threatening. Check here, not giving um, any time really for rook g7. But knight g4 now threatens knight f6 and rook takes h7 mating. Because if knight takes rook takes, we'll have a mating net there. Rook h5 check, king g2. Rook d2 check, king f3. And in the light of very, very serious threats, there's not much choice here now in this position. With the knight hanging. The rook has to be gotten rid of. Rook f5 check. Man, this creates more threats, king e3 with his own king. An exchange of rooks, does that help? The rook stumbles back to protect the knight. Knight f6, okay, it's not threatening mate or anything, but black's position seems very passive. The king is just unable to move, but this king can move. Look at that difference in mobility. Still, equal on pawns, but qualitatively, white's pieces are much better here. In fact, after rook b8, the king threatens now to help the mating net with king f4. If it can go to g5 and h6, that'd be really dangerous. For something like knight takes h7, or just even rook g7 to g8 if the king's supporting g7. So this next move seems aware of that to stop the king infiltrating too much with h6, preventing the use of g5. But king e5 and another infiltration route, very dangerous. The real killer king here 
against Judah's king. It seems a really menacing attacking piece in this position because black is tied down. The rook and knight are also just tying down black's pieces. Black seems helpless. Judith undoubtedly has a resignable position here, but she plays a5. Magnus simply takes that. Of the rook a8. Now just a6 is possible. It's it's hopeless cause. And Judith resigns. And with that, Magnus's rating escalates even more to unbelievable levels, breaking new world record uh, for the highest ever FIDO rating. <laughs> no one's stopping him. <laughs> he's only had one draw in this tournament so far, and like five wins. He's he's demolishing the field. I've not seen another classic being so dominated by anyone like this before. Usually Magnus has a hiccup in the early rounds and recovers later to win, but in this tournament he's been playing very strongly from the start with fantastic results. Let's have a look again. I can't help feeling a bit sorry for Judith. It's, um, she hasn't been playing for a while back into chess. Uh, this is certainly one huge test this tournament uh, to play in for someone that's been away from the game for some, well not, not as active as as in the, her peak activity uh, but let's let's look at the game again and see can we do better for black can we generate some counterplay let's see were there any chances missed what were the key blunders or opportunities for black so knight takes d4 knight f6 maybe a more aggressive approach is the kind of shape shaving and um, rather Shreznikov e5 move here type move more aggressive approach just like e5 straight off the bat so this kind of position might not be ridiculous okay but um, okay black doesn't want to commit a massive sin with the d5 square which uh, um, might offer some counterplay, but on the other hand, structurally, it's it's an easy, easy target potentially. D5 for maneuvers. So knight f6. We see why. Unfortunately, though, with with a nagging Moroxy bind type edge, knight c3, e6, and now this move. A3, which um, just cuts down counterplay. Really, maybe the engine doesn't like it as much, but um, how does black generate counterplay? On bishop c5, the knight went back, and the bishop went back. e4. So this Moroxy bind is set up, and black can potentially be slowly suffocated. If white's very, very careful in managing the space, making sure no weaknesses are exploitable, and that seems to be exactly what um, what happened. b6. Okay, you might think a6. I think a6 is just pointless in this position. If b5 is not going to be playable at all. Moxy bind just ties down b5 possibilities as well as d5. So it's quite a powerful bind, not just on the centre but on the queen side. So b6 in the light of a6 not being that effectual seems fair enough. Then after castles, bishop b7, bishop f4. And actually at this point, the engine still doesn't really give white as having much of an advantage. But we've seen this so many times now that the engines are giving Magnus a modest advantage, but try and play the position against Magnus, it becomes increasingly difficult. It's like the advantage is on a hillside. Magnus is climbing with those small advantages up, up, uh, up, unstoppable in an unstoppable manner. So it doesn't matter, it's a small advantage here, he's going to start gaining space soon. So rook c1, and it's almost zero here. We're talking almost zero technically, as though the engine doesn't really sense. The power of the Moroxy bind really. Rook e1, knight e5. So it looks as though nothing much going on, but uh, white is increasing a grip here. Knight fd7. Now, was the threat actually bishop g5? Let's do a threat analysis. Maybe not at all, actually. Maybe that was imagined, unless we put some more ideas. 
f5, a6, bishop f6, if black's given another move. So really, I don't know, bishop g5, I thought was interesting, but maybe isn't that interesting as a potential idea to get rid of the dark square bishops. Possibly f5, as, as the engine is indicating, might be a potential threat here, because actually uh, that bishop is is a bit loose on f4. It might justify more f5 to try and break open this diagonal. It might not be totally crazy to consider f5. So if we look at Magnus's move, bishop e3, maybe it is against f5 as well. I think f5 would be totally unplayable here in this position. E takes, and then there's f4 now as possible, and that will make it totally unplayable. So it it might have a hint of pre preventing some f5 counterplay, but in also of course dual purpose. I mean f4 is useful for gaining space for white in any case. So queen c7. Is there an interest in knight c5? Would that be potentially annoying? Couldn't it just be kicked? In any case. Was b4 strictly necessary? What is black actually threatening now after queen c7? Let's just check this out. Not really a hint of a major threat. a6 and h6 being mentioned. So it's difficult to see where black's counterplay is coming from. But um, the engine does like b4 or f4. Magnus chose b4. Okay. I guess uh, now on a6, well, f4 is on the cards in any case. So queen b8, f4 is played anyway. Knight g6. Is there a hint that d5 might be a threat here? Possibly not. It looks a little bit too risky. But um, in any case, Magnus invests a, a pawn move here uh, to just strengthen his position even more. In the art of war, you're you're meant to strengthen your position before going on to the attack to put yourself beyond defeat. So is Magnus putting himself beyond defeat here? He's got this Maroxy bind now. He's got a, a grip on key squares to keep the knights out. He is fond of keeping the opponent's knights out in particular. If we look at even just his classic games from previous years. Uh, so rook f e8, bishop f3, strengthening the position even more, and the bind. Not much counterplay at all here for black. Bishop f2. Okay, this queen is hardly going to be a nuisance like it was a week ago in the rapid game. It's got limited possibilities on a8, and e4 seems to be heavily reinforced by it, virtually, well, all of these pieces. Knight gf8. Was white actually threatening something here? Let's see what the main threats are in this position. Queen e2, h4 maybe as a target for h5. Okay, nothing majorly concrete. Okay, so let's see knight g f8, and we see queen e2. Is e5 a real threat? Not really, not necessarily. So it's still quite a quiet position with many opportunities to do all sorts of things. But um, Julia plays queen b8, which looks as though there's an interest in discouraging e5 in any case. Rook ed1, a quiet main moment in the game, really. White strengthened this position, and you know, he's climbed that small advantage, which the engine didn't think much of from this opening, into something almost approaching half a pawn, irresistibly approaching half a pawn's advantage. But this next move, I would, I would guess, is a weakening move, which is not really helping black. In fact, we see more than half a pawn after g6. Is that a kind of blunder, positional blunder, leading to a tactical disaster, as we saw later, the move g6? I wouldn't be surprised. What about h6? Just waiting, like hedgehog style. Maybe it's a more difficult nut to crack. Okay, so we see g6, 
very committal move and in fact the engine immediately likes the e5 idea after g6 is played that that's an interesting thing here uh if we, if we actually if we just go back here if e5 here this is not such a problem d takes for example it's not such a problem surely in fact bishop a6 looks looks a bit odd but uh black's more solid here the f6 and h6 squares by contrast to the game are sealed up here they're not really available for parties <laughs> but here after g6 now this 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 is just really it seems shaky after e5 okay easy to say in retrospect bishop c6 i don't know was there anything better it seems on dangerous ground now black's position and bishop c6 does does increase white's advantage okay let's let's go with d takes e here as an example f takes bishop takes knight takes is this playable a6 rook c2 rook e d8 is why it's advantage kept at bay white enjoys more space and maybe some maneuvers to attack the king here and this d file i don't know g5 looks like a totally outrageous idea mentioned here but in principle the advantage okay if we go for a saner move in principle the advantage isn't too huge if there's nothing too concrete here okay so anyway in the game we see bishop c6 so magnus now plays bishop d4 just simply reinforcing position even for even more strengthening and strengthening has been the major policy of this game to avoid uh, any counterplay any surprises from black rook e d8 and then magnus takes on c6 and he's not interested in the forceful e takes d6 he's just interested in strengthening again e5 limbs of which would be proud the overprotection of e5 as a basis for launching an attack later and in fact here the f file has been cleared away for f7 to be a target now knight e4 and here is where it becomes very very difficult for black even though queen c7 looks extremely tempting there's the probability now of b5 being effective once c4 is protected as it is now this is a very very powerful move it seems because what about the e5 pawn how did Magnus, how was he able to play this leaving e5 seemingly on praise well here a6 has mentioned pardon me a6 has mentioned here but in this in this position okay let's just check that out technically though just to make absolutely sure white is fretting now b5 that's the major threat in the position so knight takes e5 b5 let's explore this is there anything for black here an exchange sack idea it's not really perhaps that convincing this exchange sack so that's that's um i think that's good enough to prove an advantage here for white okay so he's able to now threaten b5 so a6 and now he gets time actually to protect e5 with knight f2 and again the question about e5 and c4 is asked with this move bishop g5 was judith really happy at this point or did she suspect there's something very suspect about this rook f1 and what can black do if the bishop's not going to be used for bishop d2 okay let's let's just imagine black's not interested in giving up the bishop let's go with king h8 for example what is the threat here knight f e4 is now on f7 it's, it's too much to bear this f7 problem for example rook takes 
what it takes. Knight d6 actually is a better way to get to f7 and attack the rook and the queen. In fact, that's enough. Not even needed to take on f7, just forking those pieces. So this this is pretty nasty here. It seems the bishop has to um, take because f7's on the fire. It's a double attack on g5 and f7, in fact. So committal, okay. Now, two possibilities. So let's see, rook takes c4. If this, this is taken there, well, we saw it in the game knight e5. So now, what is the problem with this? Again, knight d6 is the problem. Forking rook and queen. It's no good, this position. So in the game, we saw knight takes e5. And it was demonstrated, okay, on on bishop takes d2, queen takes d2. Okay, pardon me. Slightly different position now. On bishop takes d2, queen takes d2. If rook takes c4 here, what is happening? Rook takes c4, queen takes c4, knight e4 again is powerful with the threat of knight d6. So if black uses a move to get something done about knight d6, again knight d6 here, rook c2, let's have a look at this, queen f4, this f file looks mega dangerous. In fact what can be done about f7? Is white actually crashing through? Threatening mate seems useful, but um, let's go with bishop f2. Looks too dangerous as to play, and white does seem technically better. There's also, I think, there's a threat of knight e8 now to get onto g7. That's that's the major threat to deal with. Okay. Um, so let's let's go back. We saw bishop takes d2, rook queen takes d2, and not rook takes c4, but in fact knight takes e5. And this led to the forcing. Bishop takes e5, queen takes e5, and now some punishment on these dark squares, finally. Even after white's given up his own dark square bishop, the other pieces can work on the dark squares. Rook d6, if if the queen moves, I think it will be slaughter time. Let's have a quick look. Queen d6, say, check. Check. Queen c3, check. In this position, this looks crushing. Qu queen f3, let's go with that. And what is the actual threat here? Just rook d1 to, to undermine f8. That, that pressure on f8, rook d1 is a major threat in this position. So say, okay, um, queen d8, rook d1, queen e8. I think white's just crashing through here. It looks mega dangerous. Threats of knight f7 now, knight d6 too much. So um, Judith's move seems good in the circumstances. Rook d6 only move virtually check and we see rook takes f7 and queen f2 very powerful moves. Knights by Houdini here. c5 another move very powerful. Now b takes c maybe is there any other alternative Taking the queen, rook takes, leaves black, it seems actually with a miserable position here. So Juliet wanted to avoid this, but of course it looks like a, a winning pass pawn here. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, but um, yes, I think fundamentally it's lost. In this position, so if we go to the game uh, c5, well, this this is pretty bad as well. This is even worse, to be fair. 
uh, because now with two rooks being installed on the seventh rank, uh, it's just too much. Knight g4 threatening, knight f6, and rook h7. These checks are not really leading anywhere that good. Black is forced to uh, take now and have this dreadfully passive position. It's all over, really. The king is really threatening. King g5, h6, I think, the major threat with mate and eight. <laughs> so, um, so we see the king marching in like this. I think it's pretty hopeless to do anything else. If, if for example, check here, king d6, the king's marching in. Uh, the king will just come here. And uh, it's all over. In fact, king can afford to to do this and come back. <laughs> so it's it's pretty much all over here. Uh, okay, Judith wasn't given much counterplay, and um, I think it's no wonder during Karpov's reign after 1975, the Fisher default, he he dominated many tournaments, and he was a great fan of the Moroxy bind actually against the Sicilian defence. Uh, there's some games for example in Hastings Congress he, he tamed some very dynamic attacking players with the Moroxy bind and it seems it's a favourite also of Magnus so Magnus is kind of has elements of a Karpovian style quite often in his games to really minimise the opponent's counterplay but I think his hat which one of his trainers refers, refers to as Carlson's hats or styles of play really depends on the opponent trying to get the right hat for the right opponent like the right clothes to wear for the, the right weather you want to have the most appropriate style and against Judith it seemed this was the most appropriate style Judith didn't seem to have too much counterplay at any point in this game but um, oh well chess is sometimes a very cruel game comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much